Hello and welcome to What Did I Miss, where today I'm going over the Season 2 premiere episode of The Mandalorian, titled The Marshal, and looking for Easter eggs, references, and... <coughs> it has been a year since we last saw Din Djarin and the child, but wow, they hit the ground running with a gorgeous and grandiose episode, the likes of which are rarely seen on a production meant for the small screen. The pandemic, coupled with the immense popularity of the first season, shifted Disney's priorities, which allowed Dave Filoni and Jon Favreau to produce a story that was really spectacular. Here, I will go over the episode and break down any Easter eggs or references I noticed, and then let you know what I thought about it at the end. If there is anything I missed, let me know in the comments, and also let me know what you thought of this episode. Also, if this is your first time here, please subscribe and hit that like button. This is What Did I Miss? This will be your weekly spoiler warning for The Mandalorian, so if you have not watched it or you do not want to have it spoiled for you, please go watch it, then jump right back here. Also, I did a video before the season started of 10 things I expected to see, and so far, after one episode, I am 100%, so I will leave that link in the description if you would like to watch it too. This episode starts with a bad man walking down a dark alley. We see Mando with the child walking towards an establishment with graffiti on the walls that look like a lot of stormtroopers, rebel signets, and even what looks like C-3PO. This is similar to the propaganda you would expect to see somewhere an occupying force was removed from. Mando speaks with a Twi'lek, which we saw a few of last season, and they enter a fighting arena. He meets with an Abyssin named Gore Koresh, who Mando thinks can help him, but instead Gore is looking to acquire Mando's armor. I thought when this guy was shown in the trailers that the voice was that of Jon Favreau, but I was only half right. It's actually Jon Liquizamo, who is known for many roles, but I always remember him as the Violator from the first Spawn movie. Mando takes out Gore Crush's men in an awesome John Wick-like fight scene, which include two Zabrak aliens who are the same aliens as Darth Maul, and a Gamorrean who are the aliens shown in Jabba's palace in Return of the Jedi. Mando gets what he needs from Koresh after finding a Mandalorian on Tatooine and tricking him into giving him the information. I really like this scene as it just throws us right back into the visceral feel of this show and how it is Star Wars but definitely its own thing as I don't think you would see a Jedi leaving someone hung up to be dinner. It kind of felt like the first scene of the first season too where we get a big fight scene and then Mando ends up getting what he came for which in the first season was a bounty, and in this one, it is information. We then see the Razor Crest approach the familiar planet Tatooine, which is one of the, if not the most important planet in the Star Wars franchise. Mando lands, and we once again get to see Pelimoto, played by Amy Sedaris. I love that we start off with a familiar face, and I also like that they showed Mando is a bit different and has evolved a bit since last season as he lets the droids work on the crest. After Mando catches her up on his quest, she tells him she has never seen a Mandalorian there, besides him, and does not venture into the town that he was told to go to, which is Moss Pelgo. She then calls on R5, which is a great Easter egg, as this was the droid with a bad motivator that caused Luke Skywalker to purchase R2-D2, forever changing the fate of the universe. I honestly think that Peli's sarcastic line to him to take his time, why don't you, is a callback to the broken motivator. The droid pulls up a map and they find where the town was. Mando jumps on the speeder bike he used last season and heads off into the desert. As he rides away, we get some great shots of the terrain, and I think we see some actual Womp Rats, which were first referenced by Luke and have since been referenced by multiple characters. Mando rides up to the site, which looks very broken down even for a town on Tatooine. Mando walks into the tavern and asks the bartender if there are any other Mandalorians there, or more specifically, anyone that looks like him. The bartender tells him to ask the Marshal as a figure walks in wearing the damaged armor of Boba Fett. The man sits down and offers Mando a drink of Spachka, which Mando was offered last season while on Sorgon, as he takes off his helmet. He says his name is Cobb Vance and that he bought the armor off some Jawas, who almost made off with some of Mando's gear last season. I thought this was a great entrance. Because first of all, even though we get to see the armor of Boba Fett, we know it is not him by Timothy Oliphant's profile. But he shows that he is also not someone to be messed with as he basically stares down Mando after he demands his armor. Oliphant does have a lot of experience playing a marshal, 
most notably in the shows Justified and Deadwood, which he co-starred with W. Earl Brown, who played the bartender in this scene. Just as they are about to draw, the ground starts to rumble and they head outside. What we see next looks like the biggest sandworm we have seen since we last saw the Gummers and Tremors. Cobb explains to Mando that he is able to protect the town from sand people, but not from this thing, which is a Kriat dragon. This is really cool to see, because this creature has been mentioned before, and we've seen a skeleton of one in the sand, and Obi-Wan made the sound of a Kriat dragon to scare off sand people in Star Wars A New Hope. The two agree to work together and head off to find the creature. Cobb is riding what looks like one engine of a speed racer, like we saw Anakin Skywalker ride in The Phantom Menace. It looks like he modified a speed bike to run off the engine, which means he is a scavenger much like Rey was shown to be in The Force Awakens. Cobb explains to Mando on the trip that after the second Death Star blew up, a mining collective captured the town and made them slaves. Cobb was able to get away with a food dehydrator full of crystals. We saw this same device hold Mando's Beskar last season after he received his bounty from the child. After Cobb wandered the desert, he was found by Jawas, whom he paid for his safety, as well as the armor of Boba Fett. He took the armor and went back to the town and freed them from the mining collective. It was cool to see him in action, because for one, we saw him use the missile on the jetpack, which was awesome, and we saw his armor deflect a shot, confirming that it is in fact Beskar, as there was some confusion about this, since Beskar is not supposed to take damage, but there is a dent on Boba Fett's helmet which led people to believe his armor was not true Mandalorian armor. Mando and Cobb eventually meet up with some sand people, who it turns out want to kill the Kriot dragon as well. We then see them at a sand people camp, which looks exactly like the one we saw Anakin tear through in Attack of the Clones. Mando tries to get Cobb and the sand people to work together after being enemies in the past. The sand people set up a trap for the beast at an abandoned Sarlacc pit, which does not go well. I found it was interesting that Mando mentions that the Kriot dragon ate the Sarlacc living in this pit, perhaps foreshadowing the story behind the appearance of another character. Mando volunteers the people in the village to help the Sand People, even though they are enemies. Together Cobb and Mando convince the town to help them in their cause. Before they go, Mando says that joining forces is their only hope, which is a variation of the line Princess Leia said to Obi-Wan and was heard by Luke Skywalker in A New Hope. Cobb has to break up a fight as they load up ordnance, which adds even more tension to the group. They identify the belly as the weak spot of the creature, and set up a firing line outside of the cave. They plan to draw the beast out and then blow up a trap underneath it. The raiders draw out the creature and it is just magnificent. I don't ever remember seeing something so enormous and marvelous on a TV show. I would say this rivals and defeats any other creatures I've seen recently on shows like The Witcher and Game of Thrones. It was just so huge. The battle that ensues is kind of like if you cross the movie Jaws with the battles in the Lord of the Rings movies, as you just have people and giant arrows flying everywhere. They want to draw the beast out, but of course it will not cooperate. They blow the charges, but it does not kill the creature. Cobb and Mando suit up and take off with their jetpacks, which is also remarkable to see along with close-up shots we get from the monster. Mando then takes the detonator from the last set of explosives from Cobb and hits his jetpack, which makes him fly off. I couldn't help but laugh, because that jetpack sure has some bad luck. Mando appears to be consumed by the beast, but he then flies out of it and detonates the explosives, which finally kill it. The survivors rejoice as the sand people harvest the animal, and Cobb gives his armor to Mando. A Tusken Raider pulls out a pearl from the creature, which is in fact a callback to the creature's appearances within Star Wars lore. Mando heads off towards the twin sons of Tatooine, as we get our first shot of an aged and battle-hardened Boba Fett. I really, really like this episode, if you couldn't already tell, and it may actually be my favorite so far of the show. Everything just looks so huge, and it makes me think this season is going to be a tremendous tale. Even though we spent most of the time on a planet we are familiar with, we got to meet a new character in Cobb, who has played very well and is another character from Star Wars lore. And we caught up with a familiar face in Peli, a character played by a comedian I really like. I also like the little nods that Mando is evolving as a character and still trying to find his way, but is becoming more trusting and tolerant. But what I really loved about this episode is that it brought back the same feelings that the first season did for me, which is that I think this show just plays out like an RPG video game, which I love. Each episode starts with a quest, 
Mando talks to a few people and gets a widget or meets an NPC and then goes after the big bad and ends up with new gear. It is a standard loot mission you would find in any RPG game and I really love that the show either consciously or by happenstance seems to always work out like this. Mando continues to level up his traits, so to speak, as well as his gear, and I can't wait to play again. But you let me know, what did I miss? Did you catch any references that I did not pick up on? Let me know in the comments and also let me know how you think Boba Fett survived the Sarlacc and how much he is going to be in the season. If you also like Star Trek Discovery, I do weekly videos about that show as well and I will leave the link to those in the description here. I will see you next time on What Did I Miss?